Innovative businesses see every day as an opportunity to create something new. Dell Technologies advisors are here with tools and expertise to help you do incredible things. Because Dell Technologies believes there's an innovator in all of us, learn more about smart PCs powered by the Intel V Pro platform that's built for business. Find tech that's right for you by calling a Dell Technologies advisor today at 877-ASK-DELL. Pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement, welcome to another Greatest Hits Rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, but you can call me Fintern. Well, we meet again. Joe and OG left in a hurry. Pizza boxes on the floor. Oh, and a note here attached to an SD card. It says, hey Fintern, play this. It's from that time Chris Field joined us to talk about how to add real giving into your financial plan. Oh, I remember that episode. Chris was a great guest, and there were a bunch of aha moments. So here, I'll just plug this in, click here. This episode originally aired back in 2021, so enjoy this rewind to a great show, but ignore any giveaways or mentions of current events. Wait, 2021 was in the middle of COVID. Were there even any current events besides long walks outside? Either way, enjoy. Fin turn out. Good morning, Christopher Robin. Oh, good morning, Winnie the Pooh. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and who actually has time to make the world a better place? Today's guest, Chris Field, brings good news. You can disrupt the world for good in only 14 minutes a day. But what do you do with the other 63 minutes? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know there's 72 minutes in a day. Plus, the new inflation numbers are out, and wow, those are eye-popping. As is yet another TikTok snafu that's going to make one boss lose his job. And finally... We'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to Nathan, who was wondering if he should buy his friend's business that recently came on the market. And I'll get your gears turning with my trivia. And now, two guys who could start by spending 14 minutes a day working to disrupt my world for good. It's Joe and oh, j j j j g I know how to disrupt Doug's world. Let's eat all of his peanut M&Ms. That'll really ruin it. And that's for good, too. Who needs those calories? He doesn't need those calories. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Getting Doug in Shape, Doug Boot Camp 2021. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Across the card table from me to kick off the week, it's Mr. OG. I just want to go back to one thing you said. I don't think peanut M&Ms have calories. That's what makes them so great. Because oh. the peanut has a negative and because it's good for you. And then the chocolate is a you know slight positive. And so those things, they, they even out. It's like they hit each other and go the opposite way. The streams cross. Uh, interesting. Science for the win, folks. It's, we we got a fantastic show today. We got Chris Field OG here with us. This guy's done some really little things like rescue kids from slavery, true. you know. Tiny, tiny things, but he's going to talk about a billion hours of good. And you know what? What a great way to start off your week thinking about doing more for your community. And oh, gee, he makes it really easy. I can't wait to talk to him. He's upstairs talking to mom now. But first, oh, gee, I think you know what that sound means. Money in the bank. It's like another angel got its wings. Another person (laughs) got started finally with Shopify. It's your sign to this year. Finally, forget about those run of the mill resolutions and instead start your own new year's revolution. You know, you and I were talking Ah. about this. This is where the revolution thing came from that we were talking about. Yes. It was the Shopify read who knew it's the sound to start shelling on Shopify. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide, whether you're selling socks or selling what's something else you'd sell using Shopify. Oh, gee. Coffee filters. Yes. Coffee filters. Monogrammed coffee filters. Could be the next thing. Reusable. (laughs) Shopify simplifies selling online 
and in person so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Packed with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. This is what I like, OG, best about Shopify, is that as we gear up with more guides this year, with more trainings this year, we're going to put a bunch of stuff behind the Stacking Benjamin show. Shopify helps us forget about trying to know every little thing about how the sales process works and focus on the financial planning piece. We're good at the financial planning piece. With Shopify, we don't have to be great at the how does a P what does POS even mean? What's a POS system? I think sometimes there's, I think Doug's a POS. I think there's two definitions. I'm pretty sure that's not the one that they're using. Now I'm kidding, Doug. That that's a, that's a, you know, look at him get all get, wow, Doug. It's gonna be okay. Hey, uh, now it's your turn, stackers, to get serious about selling and try Shopify today. This is possibility powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash SB, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash SB to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash SB. Maybe, and I'm not answering. <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth. Well, maybe it's time to become the CFO in your financial house, OG. And to do that, you can partner up with Navy Federal Credit Union. Start off with paying down credit card debt. You could get a low intro APR. A yeah. On balance transfers that are platinum credit card. It's their lowest rate card. Great tool to pay less interest while you're paying down debt. Let's say you've got that next home improvement project. I don't know. Let's say maybe you're going to repair a hallway um, right yeah. off your garage. Maybe your son drove a car through the garage wall and you've the got two by fours on order at Home Depot. Theoretically, they offer a home equity line of credit with convenient access to funds when you need them at a variable rate. You could also get a fixed rate equity loan that has set monthly payments for large purchases, but consolidating debt with a home equity loan could also streamline and lower your monthly payments. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA, equal housing lending, membership required, loan subject to approval. Call 1-888-842-6328 for details about credit cost and terms. HELOC APR is low as 6.5% as of November 23rd, 2022. Look at these guns, dude. You don't have guns. Nothing to look at. Oh, come on. You know what is great is that uh, you and I talk about uh, the car. All right, we got Chris Field, but we have an important, important headline first. And of course, our TikTok minute. So let's get rolling. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from CNBC and also comes to us from anywhere. You see the new consumer price index report, OG? Uh, yeah, yeah. Caught a wind of it. Big problems and little inflation. <laughs> inflation climbs higher than expected in June as the price index rises 5.4% over a year ago. Inflation surged in June. It is. Oh. Are we supposed to be clapping or are we supposed to be doing this? Depends on which side of the equation you're on. <laughs> I think it's probably, probably the second one for most people. It's its fastest pace in nearly 13 years amid a burst in used vehicle cost and price increases in food and energy. Labor Department reported last Tuesday it uh, was up 5.4% from a year earlier, the largest jump since 2008, just before the worst of the financial crisis. Economists surveyed by Dow Jones have been expecting a 5% gain. Here's, here's the thing. This looks bad, OG, but it isn't as bad as... It seems. Don't get me wrong. It's not a walk in the park, but a lot of these numbers are what the Labor Department is calling transitory mm -hmm. in quotes. Here's the reason why. Used car prices went through the roof because of the new car market and the problem getting semiconductor chips. So used car prices heated up. A lot of those prices are already, according to experts in that area, already coming down. The second piece Prices also going up in areas where a year ago they went through the floor. And one area is airline travel, as an example. Yeah. Remember how easy it was a year ago to get a ticket on a plane? 
those days are over. Yeah, that's the, that's the problem with looking at year over year comparisons because you have to recognize what the other year was. Some of it is just the offsetting of getting back to quote unquote normal and the kick in the teeth that everything was in the second quarter of 2020 versus 2021. Some of it is the vast oversupply of money, which by definition has to be inflationary because when there's more money, there's more people that want to buy stuff and they can do so on credit. So that becomes more money itself. And then that person gets to have more stuff and more money. And then the next person gets to have more stuff and more money. And so the prices have to go with that. So some of it is that. And then some of it is, you know, like supply chain stuff, right? Like you're saying, whether it's the cars or, you know, and you see that in lots of areas, it's not just automobiles and semiconductor chips, it's furniture and and some cases food. But the difference with food, however, is that if there's a supply chain issue at a grocery store, usually the grocer will substitute a similar product that isn't, you know, like if Yo play yogurt can't deliver, you'll just get a different kind of yogurt, you know? So food and energy, that's one that will affect people, you know, cause that's something, but used car prices, that only affects you if you're buying a used car. So maybe hold your horses a smidge if you think they're too high. But there's also some good news with this, which is uh, the estimates of Social Security increases yeah. for next year. Have you seen those? Yeah, that definitely has uh, retirees smiling. I think they're estimating that it'll be the largest increase since like 1960 or something. People are going like to get six or seven percent, much much bigger paycheck from the government. It's probably not good to call it a paycheck, is it? Probably getting a return of your taxes. Return of your taxes. There you go. After uh, the government wisely invested it. They are now returning it to you after you've trusted them for 35 years. Here has been my, my retirement. Please invest it wisely and return it to me with interest and copious amounts. But if you look at Social Security, we give, we give it a lot of crap, you know, Social Security. And do we take it at 62? Do you take it at 70? Someplace in the middle. And it's not a good payoff and all that stuff. Do the math on Social Security. Like go on SSA.gov. Look at your Social Security history and look how much money you've put in and then look at what your benefit will be or is and multiply that out. Now, if you get hit by a bus five minutes into getting Social Security, yeah, you lost. You didn't win that bet. But if you live a pretty decent, you know, 80, 85, 90, somewhere in there, it's a pretty good ROI. Not as great as it would be if we got to invest our own money, but then you've got the whole human behavior thing of, yeah, maybe I wouldn't invest my seven and a half percent or, well, you know, whatever. It's so. it's the key that just keeps on giving, which is it's hidden money, right? It's been yeah. taken away from you. You have to hand it over. And Compulsatory. Then, yeah. And then they, they give it back to you and and you end up with this nice return. I think there's a couple other areas here that we should talk about while you're discussing investment. This is also why having a lot of money in a savings account, OG, is not safe. And people are like, well, what does inflation have to do with the savings account? If if your savings account did less than 5.4% last year, you lost money on your savings. There's a lot of people that did the right thing by saving money, but they left it in a savings account instead of investing it, and they, they lost purchasing power. And you have to trade away some of that for emergency fund. I think you're not sure. talking about the emergency fund. You're talking about something beyond that. When when Absolutely. you get paralysis and you've got extra money setting aside and you can't figure out what to do with it or how to invest it. And what's funny is I just read this article about how juxtaposed people are thinking about inflation. And the real answer to inflation is more stocks. When you go to the grocery store, what do you take with you? Do you take your income or do you take your account statements? You take your income, right? You don't, you don't go, well, I've got but much of money in my brokerage account. <laughs> you go, how much income did I get this month in order to buy groceries? And if you look at the history of the rising dividends over you know, an entire lifetime, that's been the thing that's outpaced inflation. Obviously, the stock price also outpaces inflation, but the rising dividends paid by the biggest companies in the world and in the United States outpaces that. So the answer to inflation concerns isn't, I'm going to go buy... I bonds or something like that. It's 
you actually need to buy more stock. Which makes sense because if you're buying into a company for that company to succeed, they have to beat inflation. They have to keep up with Absolutely. inflation. They have to. So you're it's just not dollar for dollar and it doesn't happen simultaneously. Yeah, sure. It's not instantaneous, I should say. But then they're also rewarded for innovation, right? In the face of rising costs, what do companies try to do? They try to figure out a way around that. They try to maintain their profit margins because their obligation is to shareholders. Their obligation is to produce a profitable result for shareholders. So when they have market forces, whether it's inflation or competition or you know whatever those externalities are, the smart people at the company are going to try to figure out how do I make a profit amidst all of this chaos? And sometimes that chaos is inflation and rising costs. So that spurs innovation to help keep costs low, which of course, innovation is great because you get more bang for your buck. So it's a great cycle. Buy more stock, everybody. The third piece of this I want to talk about that we've heard lots of reports on, of course, we talked last week about people changing jobs. A lot of people right now getting raises being enticed to stay. And I think this may be, remember how we talked about last year, it might be a bad time to ask your boss for a raise. This might be a great time to ask your boss for a raise. Huh. Unless your boss is creating a podcast, in which case, bad time. Podcast uh, people who are listening. Speak, speak it directly to our team. Unless you work <laughs> for the Stacky Benjamins podcast. Yeah, unless that's the case. I get what you're saying, though, OG. I mean, really, you know, we joke about podcasting, but uh, y- you should look at your field. It's not going to be the best time ever for everybody. But yeah, I think in a lot of fields right now is a time when you might have a little leverage going, you know, I love working here. This is a great place. Here's the statistics on our industry. Here's what this other company would want to pay me. I would much prefer to stay here. I uh, heard a story of a, from a friend whose son just graduated college and got his first job and was working and everything was hunky-dory and got an unsolicited email from, the, from HR that said, everybody who just got hired is getting a $20,000 pay raise. Oh, man. <laughs> just, just to keep up. I'm like... All those darn whippersnappers making all that money. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. Yeah. So don't get any ideas, Doug. (laughs) Well, that's. I think there's a lot there. When we see these inflation numbers, number one, I don't think they are what people think they are. Uh, There are some transitory numbers here, but wages going up and some costs going up and the value of how to save. I think so many lessons we can learn from this particular headline. We've got even more links, by the way, to it in our show guide, stackybenjamins.com forward slash stacker to get the guide to the Monday and Wednesday shows. Hey, but I think it's time, OG, for our TikTok Minute. Once a week, you and I take a look at the fun world of TikTok and find a video that sometimes it makes us roll our eyes, other times just makes us laugh. Sometimes it makes us think. This one might be a little bit of all of the above, OG, because uh, this young woman uh, got an email and, uh, well, let's listen in. I uh, applied for this job as a brand representative um, to a company called Ava Lane, and their motto is Beauty Through Confidence. And this is an email I accidentally got sent from the VP. Enjoy. Not that cute. Okay. 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 And you may want to go to the either the guide or our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com to watch this. But, oh, gee, she gets this email. You hear that she got this email. Let me read to everybody what the email says. Re photos and Instagram handle. This girl is fresh out of college. Hope College. Not that far from where I grew up, by the way. Yep. Great school in West Michigan. And not that cute. She applied to the sales model position. Are you sure you want me to interview her? Thanks. Chuck DeGrendel, VP of operations, Ava Lane Boutique. See you, Chuck. Yeah. And that's the, that by the way, is the tag that I saw looking at this today. That's the hashtag. RIP Chuck. RIP Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. Chuck did a, did a very, not that cute. OG. Reminds me of, uh video that I saw. I don't, I'm not on TikTok, but uh, Instagram has these things now. Obviously, they're trying to compete with them. And this person said, dance like nobody's watching. And it's got like, you know, yeah, they're like dancing. And then it goes, but text an email like that is going to be read in court one day. <laughs> yes. I think there's a good lesson. Uh, but there's another lesson. 
Don't be a jerk. Yeah. What do you want your brand to really say? You know, yeah. I mean, if he's got that attitude anyway, she's not that cute. Do I need to interview her? What, to, what are you trying to do with your brand? I don't know. Not good. I would have never got interviewed ever. <laughs> You're very cute. Thank you. Just thrilled. I get to sit across from you three days a week, living the dream. And the other four days I just hang around. <laughs> you got a TikTok video for us. Shoot me a link, Joe at stackybenjamins.com. And I'd love to love to take a look at whatever you see that uh, maybe like this one makes your eye roll or go, whoops. All right. Time for you and I to refill the coffee. We've got Chris Field upstairs talking to mom. So let's get ready for our big interview. Doug, how about some trivia, my friend? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we're about to hear about changing the world in just 14 minutes. And before we get to that, Joe, I got to say that this crew can do a lot in 14 minutes, but probably different than what Chris Field has in mind because there ain't a whole lot of positive disruption going on. Know what I mean? I mean, here's what I mean. Joe's mom drags out a four minute story over 14 minutes. And it's also probably the 14th time I've heard that story. It's been less than 14 minutes since OG has complained about something like, like anything. He pretty much complains about it all. It's not going to take me 14 minutes though, giving you a trivia question on this date in 1935. The first parking meter was installed in the U.S. The question is, what city was it in? I'll be back with your answer faster than Joe can parallel park, which is unlikely to be less than 14 minutes. Have you ever wondered how on earth your friend bought their home? Or why your coworker meticulously splits the tab down to the last Diet Coke? My college roommate did that. Hey, Joe, if you're listening, <laughs> that is you. And Joe's laughing right now because we just talked about this a couple weeks ago. Well, Other People's Pockets is a show about other people's money. Host Maya Lau asks people from all walks of life to get radically transparent about their personal finances in actual dollar amounts. You'll hear from a dominatrix who gets paid to bully men at the ATM, an elite scientist who couch surf to survive, a business prodigy who flipped his services from drugs to dumbbells, and more. You can find Other People's Pockets wherever you get your podcasts. Conspiracy theories. Paranormal. UFOs. During the entire 1971 debacle of this red dye number two, parents all around America were buying Frankenberry. So only a few days after the cereal was released, kids all across the country started being rushed to hospitals. All of them had one symptom in common. Theories of the third kind on YouTube or wherever you listen. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, respected author, frequent speaker at the G7 summits and internationally renowned time management expert. And if you've spent any time with us, you'll realize that the acorn called Joe doesn't fall far from his mom's tree. If you know what I mean, he'll tell the same travel stories over and over and over and over again. But let me give it 14 minutes and you'll be out of there. And then, not to flex too much, but I can totally go up and down the stairs 17 times in 14 minutes. It, it'd be faster if Joe's mom would repair that third step and do something about the low ceiling. But 17 times? I mean, that's pretty awesome, right? Now, so we can get you to Chris Field's 14 minutes of daily disruption, let's get you today's trivia. The question was, on this date in 1935, the first parking meter was installed in the U.S. What city was it in? Wait, is this a, this is a joke, right? You're telling me that Oklahoma City installed the first parking meter? What, was it, was it the parking meter in front of the only bathroom facility with indoor plumbing in Oklahoma? <laughs> well, there's been some real progress in OKC now that they have four buildings with indoor plumbing. Hey, just go ahead and send your hate mail to Taylor at stackingbenjamins.com. He wrote this garbage. I totally love OKC nearly as much as I love KFC or CBD. Uh, okay, I just I'm going to get out of here before I upset more listeners. Let's say hello to Chris Field.
And on my dad's shortwave radio, it's my new friend, Chris Field. How are you, man? Man, I'm doing awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. I very much have been looking forward to this for the last uh, couple of weeks. There's an elephant in the room I got to ask you about first. I did not intend, by the way, to start here. And as I'm doing like last minute fill in the blanks research on Chris Field, I find this story. I'm a big ice cream fan. Yeah. And you have written the most viral ice cream review on the internet. That's true. It's probably the thing, the least important thing that I'm most well known for, (laughs) certainly. So a few years ago, Bluebell Ice Cream came out with their Christmas cookies flavor, which was a seasonal flavor that they had never done before. And I had done a few Bluebell reviews just for fun, but this one just exploded. I think it had something like 65,000 shares, reached two or three million people. And Interestingly enough, if you Google Chris Field ice cream, you'll find that it made its way into newspapers. It made it into the Atlanta Journal Constitution, the Houston Chronicle. So it was it was a lot of fun. I love the ice cream and Bluebell were they were great sports about I'm only about 45 minutes from their factory in Brenham, Texas. And so I drove down there the next week and actually ate ice cream with the CEO and Uh, We had a good time. Well, I definitely hope the discussion that we have today hits because in a billion hours of good, you begin the journey, Chris, by giving readers an invitation. And I want to ask you specifically about this invitation because you say, and I'll quote you, we can reimagine everything you've ever believed to be true about your ability to create authentic and lasting transformation in the world around you. This implies... I think what it implies is what most of us believe about the world around us and our ability to affect that is false. What is it that most of us should reimagine when it comes to that journey? So I think most of us believe that world change is limited to a very select few individuals, people that, you know, just have this innate charisma or gifting or people that have tons of money or people that. Uh, end up with some unique skill set that nobody else has. And I think that's completely, completely overrated. The reality is that the world is being changed by ordinary, plain, just regular folks that whose names we've never heard of, whose stories we'll never hear every single day at a clip far, far larger than all of those other people I described. And the truth is that most of us are kind of waiting for this grand moment. You know, we're waiting until our kids reach a certain age, until our bank account reaches a certain number, until we retire. And the problem is we're going to keep moving those goalposts the rest of our lives. And and then we're going to end up in a rocking chair at some point on a front porch, and we're going to have a lot of regrets. And so for me, my whole mission and passion in life is to help ordinary people believe they have everything it takes to change the world right where they are with a lot less time than they think. Just by the way, you're talking about this. You're talking about it in terms of sacrifice. Like people believe that to do good, there has to be some sacrifice. And you spend this entire book saying that's not true. Right. Absolutely. I mean, even the way we think about sacrifice, right? Sacrifice implies giving up something at a loss to ourselves. And I think the reality is, even if anyone has just dabbled in doing good, they know the return that comes from that. We were made to thrive and to make impact. And so I think this that's the whole idea for me is really believing that we can make an impact. And, and what we typically view as sacrifice is not actually that. I think I love podcasting so much because I love this idea of stories And you tell this wonderful story that illustrates the point that you just talked about through this friend of yours named Connor. Do you mind telling us about Connor? Yeah, no, I don't mind at all. So Connor is a young, late 20s graphic designer, works for one of the most well-known and sought-after innovation speaker in the entire world, does a ton of his multimedia stuff. The dude just oozes talent. And he's not just talented. He's just a good guy. You said he's he's a lot of fun to be around. Yeah, just a good, like, you just like him, you know, every email, hope you're having a killer day, you know, hope you're crushing the day, go get out there and crush it today, you know, just like, he's just a good dude. And in this conversation with Connor that I was having one time, 
because his company had brought me in to do some social media. I, I have a, a business that does social media marketing and consulting, and they brought me in to get some ideas for me on how to grow their social presence. And so Connor was my main point of contact. And just one day as we talked, and we talked some about work I had done in Ghana with rescuing children out of um, child slavery. And, you know, you I could just sense that Connor had this, it was just like, he felt like, man, I got a lot of really cool stuff going on. And I really like my life, but man, that feels really meaningful. Like, I wonder if I'll ever do something like that someday. In that conversation, when I picked up on that from Connor, I was like, dude, I got to tell you, you're one of the most ridiculously talented people I know. Like you have so much creativity. You have so many gifts and skills and talents. The market just freaking loves what you have to offer. How have you not made the connection that there are a thousand nonprofits and humanitarian organizations, people doing good that would kill for a day of your time. They would kill to have you creatively solving a couple of their specific unique problems. I was like, you don't have to go to Africa with me on a boat and meet child slaves to be able to make a huge impact. Like literally every day, the skills you use that make you great at your job can translate into doing good for other people. And, and it was just like a light came on. And, you know, for me, honestly, Joe, that was a huge turning point for me in realizing everyone I meet wants to do more good and they don't because they don't know where to start and they think it takes too much time. And I'm fascinated by this idea that we've separated philanthropy or doing good from work. There's such a hard line drawn between these two that the average person doesn't ever connect the dots that the same skills that make them great from eight to five are the same exact skills that the market needs to create real change and transformation. It's like people tell me, I had a lawyer the other day tell me about this thing she wanted to make a difference on. I mean, this lady's ridiculously successful lawyer. And she's like, I just wish. And I'm like, wait, I was like, you realize every day you gather facts, you organize, you make compelling cases for the people you believe in. Like, those are all the same skills that this organization, that this problem you're saying, like it needs that gather the facts, overcome the objections, write a great story that tells people, you know, why this is a compelling reason. And she's just, you literally, it felt like you could see a light come on in her head. Like I won't say literally and misuse it, but I was waiting for her, for the little thing above her head to be like the chime to come on. Like I was watching a television <laughs> show, you know, because it was just like, she goes, oh my gosh. You're right. It's like, I do have those skills already. So that's really the story of Connor's. And it's the story of all of us. It's realizing we don't need to go looking for the skills and the talents to change the world. We possess them already. And it's doing more intentionally and with thoughtfulness and consistency what each of us is already doing every single day. Stacky Benjamins, it shouldn't surprise you, Chris, our fans are a bunch of math nerds, right? Some people like me, not as mathy as others, but we've got a good number of those people here. And I want to walk through some of the math. I want to get back to specifically why you talk about 14 minutes. But with Connor, you went through a bunch of math. Like it was, if I remember this discussion right, he was stuck on like giving $100 here, giving $100 there. And you're like, that's fine, but take this 14 minutes and that's multiply right. it by his hourly rate, like the amount yeah. that he would get. He can, to use his language, he could crush it for this yeah. for this charitable organization. Yeah, I mean, it's the scale, right? And all of us are looking for that multiplier. I mean, this is why people listen to your podcast, right? Is we're all looking for those multipliers. How do and this is the power of compounding interest, right? Even though you, you explain compounding interest to the average person, they think you're telling them a trick, right? Like if you say, hey, you know, if you put this much money into an account from these years and then never put another dollar in, you'd have this much at the end. But if you waited 15 years, you'd have to seven times, whatever that number is, right? And people are like, no, you know, it's like, I, there's some tricky there. And it's like, I mean, yeah, it feels like magic, but it's just the, and, what I talk about in the book is the power of compounding time is just as powerful as the power of compounding interest. And for Connor, it was if you took 14 minutes a day, seven days a week on average, that's going to give you just under two hours a week, which is eight hours a month, which is 100 hours a year. Now, if you ask the average person, hey, uh, I'd really like you to do more good this year. 
Can you help find a hundred hours that you're free to do some good and then call me and I'll tell you how to use those hundred hours. People are like, dude, that's two and a half weeks of working. That's all my vacation time for the whole year. I could never swing that. It's like, I get it. Can you do 14 minutes a day? And it's like, well, of course I can find 14 minutes a day. So it's like, great. Then let's just do it in little increments and it'll add up to massive change. And like for Connor, if he used those 14 minutes a day for a month, it gives him eight hours. And what if he created a robust marketing plan for a small local nonprofit that he believes in, gifted them that, they executed it with the people who already believe in their cause. It's very likely to turn into five, 10, 15, $20,000 if well done. Whereas Connor would have thought his best gift would have been a hundred bucks that he could give that small nonprofit. And now not only has he given them the gift of five, 10, 15, 20,000 bucks, he's taught them how to create a better marketing plan. So even if they don't use him the next time, they're going to be able to leverage and multiply what he's done over and over and over again. There's another story that you tell that emphasizes that point, just as I do good personally, the people around me see that. You tell another phenomenal story, that, and we've all been here a hundred times, uh, Chris, the story about Gabe. Yeah, there's a little boy named Gabe at the post office with his mom. She's exhausted. Nobody wants to be at the post office. You can tell she's just she's already ready to be done, and they're not even close to the front of the line. And it just it started with a a man that pointed out a lucky coin on the ground, and Gabe, you know, so excited, stuffs it into his little pocket, uh, you know, and then somebody else comes, you know, starts kind of having a conversation with him, an older woman. You could tell she's probably a grandma. She asks him how old, how old he is. And he shows her five fingers and, you know, she like acts like she's going to faint. She can't believe how big he is. And he's just grinning from ear to ear. Right. And I grab a box from a, somebody had discarded an empty box. And I ask his mom if I can give it to him so he can ride in the pirate ship up to the front of the line. And, and you could just tell this, this whole line of grumpy people suddenly, our world became a little bit brighter because we're watching this little boy sort of come to life from the positive, uh, you know, interaction that he's having. And his mother, of course, just wants to kiss every person in that line. And so it was such a poignant reminder to me that good begets good and compassion begets compassion. And when we see generosity begets generosity, fill in the blank, right? When we see people being generous, when we see people doing good, when we see people being kind, we're motivated, we're reminded, we're inspired. I honestly think it's just because we get so busy, we forget. I think all of us want to do it more. You know, who's the first person that pays for the drink behind them in Starbucks? And then it becomes a, an hour long thing. Right. Do you think all those other people that were part of that hour would have done that? No, they would have never started the domino. But once it was started, they were like, oh, I love this. I'm not going to let this in. This is so cool, Right. Well, the world needs more of those first people in line at Starbucks kind of people, the ones who aren't reacting to the ones in front of them that push over the first domino, but the ones who are actively saying every day when we open our front door, hey, there's going to be a hundred chances today to use the gifts and talents I already have to make the world a little better. What's that first domino I can push down? What's that first little bit of good I can do? It's going to make somebody's day brighter. And, and maybe sometimes it doesn't end up being a, a ripple effect, but we don't know. We will never know until we do that first move how many people are going to follow us. And every time I go to the post office, I think of Gabe. And now because of my book, I guarantee you there are thousands more people that every time they walk in a miserable post office – they are going to be thinking about Gabe and it's going to make them more thoughtful, maybe not just in the post office, but maybe when they leave, et cetera. But it's actually funny, Chris. I actually think about that old guy that started it to your point about Starbucks. It totally. was, it was that old guy who changed, not just Gabe's experience and his mom, he changed everybody's experience. Absolutely. I would have never given that box to Gabe that would have never been in my book. You would have never asked me that question. I mean, I think that's the power of good moments is that, they're, they're ripple effects in a pond that we will literally never see the end of. I mean, it's so fascinating to think about when we choose to live with this sort of intentionality that the good we're doing has the potential to last for generations because that's stories that people will tell their own children, 
who will tell their children. And it's just a magical thing to think about. Where does the number 14 come from? Because it could have been 15. It could have been 30. It could have been nine. Why, why 14? Yeah. So your math folks will appreciate this. 1% of your day is 14.4 minutes. So I rounded down to 14 minutes a day and I thought, look, we're all busy. We all have a lot going on, but surely each one of us can give 1%, a measly 1% of our day. Uh, so that's where the 14 minutes came from. You, you even tell us, by the way, in, a, in what I thought was a hilarious chapter, how to get the 14 minutes back, which made me, as I'm reading through your list, what BS it would be if I said I don't have 14 minutes. Because like, number yeah. one is stop hitting the snooze button, time save five minutes. I, that's probably 15 for me. Prep yeah. your coffee maker before you go to bed. There's two minutes. Make your coffee at home instead of going to Starbucks. That line, to your point, yeah. there's another five. So, And you go through like all these ways to get the 14 minutes to do something good. So it's not even, it isn't even extra time. You know, for a lot of us, we wonder where to start. I remember thinking that I wanted to get involved in my community when I was in my, maybe my early 30s. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't know where to start. How did you start? To be honest, even when I started, it's probably not how you're thinking I might answer that question. And and that is, I started when I graduated from high school and I went to work at a, a camp for inner city kids. All of a sudden, I had a, a great parents, great upbringing, and I realized that that camp uh, with a lot of kids, it was basically a camp for kids who couldn't afford to go to camp. That summer, I realized I was 18 years old and I was like, oh my gosh, I have been very, very sheltered. Like there's a lot of really hard stuff in life that not only have I not experienced it, I haven't even appreciated it. Like I have no sense of scale for how much pain and brokenness there is in the world. And that, I mean, that crushed me. It, it crushed me to meet little boys and girls with cigarette burns up and down their arms. And, you know, we're searching bags of teenagers for weapons and drugs when they come to summer camp. I mean, it's just like, what is happening right now? And, but in that, in that camp, I ended up directing that camp, by the way, uh, at 19, they hired me to take over and direct that camp, which is crazy. I was the end of my freshman year of college. I did that for four years and it, it was just completely transformational for me. And so from then on, I started looking for those ways I could make an impact. I ran for mayor of my hometown when I was 19 years old. I, you know, started running marathons. I started a marathon in my hometown, which has become one of the most popular marathons in the state of Texas and raised a million dollars for charity. 11 years ago, I started a nonprofit in Ghana, Africa, rescuing children out of human trafficking and reunited them, reuniting them back into their families. I mean, when I started looking around me, the question no longer became what should I do, but which one of these things should I do? Because just the way I viewed the world completely changed. And, and, and I really believe when we start to look around us with empathy and with concern for others, um, that we'll find way more things and opportunities that we could help with than we could ever possibly one of us have time for. It seems to me that you had to put yourself in that situation because for, and, and for me, that was the case. I felt bad at first. Yeah. And I remember telling a coach, Chris, that I didn't feel, and I, and I still feel horrible talking about this, that I didn't feel strongly about anything. I right. mean, I, I just didn't feel compelled. And my mom had really bad arthritis. So, and a client of mine was the head of the local arthritis foundation chapter. So I started donating time to the arthritis foundation and when I saw these kids with juvenile arthritis yeah. and, and I put myself in that position, all of a sudden it was to your point, you know, but I feel like you got to put yourself out there first. If you're not feeling anything, I think you got to put yourself in that compassionate spot. Yeah. And I also think we need to ask ourselves why we're not feeling. I think that we've become really good at not letting ourselves feel, to be honest. I mean, I think we numb ourselves with drugs and alcohol and sex and money sometimes, if we're being honest, right? We numb ourselves by saving or spending money in certain ways because it makes us feel like we're in control. And so I think the first thing we have to be really honest, like why do we not feel sometimes about things that we really should feel, right? Like how have we lost some of that sense of compassion and empathy 
but then not just stopping there. We go, okay, I felt that. I felt bad. It's like the world is not changed by people who feel bad. Um, the world is changed by people who feel bad enough to do something about it and to show up and to have courage. And so one thing I want to say to your point, even about you showing up at the Arthritis Foundation is I think a lot of us have this sense that like we only have one chance to make a difference. And so we we have this paralysis by analysis, right? We're creating spreadsheets to figure out where we should go volunteer our time. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Right, like it's you're gotta probably, be perfect. It's gotta yeah, be perfect, you're, the perfect you're thing. Probably my. not gonna find that the first place you show up. You may think somewhere you go, you're gonna do two, three, five, seven, ten things. And so you you know, you didn't date, you probably didn't date one person and end up marrying them, right? You probably didn't the job you got at 16 is probably not the job you have at 45 if you're listening to this show. So it's like you got to where you are by experiencing and learning from each of those experiences. And I don't understand why we think philanthropy or giving would be any different. We learn by doing. And so we have to do. So show up, experience, be reflective, take what you like, take what you don't like, move on to the next thing. And then eventually you're going to find that thing where it converges between what you do best and what you care the most about. And when those two things converge, look out because that is when the power of transformation just explodes and and people you know what happens then people start getting behind you because then without even trying you become a leader because everyone is looking for those passions and everyone is looking for that leadership and so then people start saying to you hey i want to go where you're going and i don't even it doesn't even have to be my passion i mean i've had people tell us about our work in ghana they're like chris I love Ghana now, but they're like, if you'd been doing orphanages in Haiti, if you'd been doing food security in China, they were like, I was following you and you just happened to go to Ghana. And I think that's the power of when you clearly are living passionately, people just want to be a part of that and they're going to go wherever you take them. And then they're going to find new things that they care deeply about. It's so infectious. And that feeling to your point after the Arthritis Foundation, I've been involved in in so many different ways and still not as much as I could be as I, as I read your book, I think 14 minutes and I could be spending so much more time and, and not have it make my day worse. My day would be so much, so much better. Uh, you have a story about, uh, about Wally. Yeah. So interestingly, Wally was the first kid in my cabin at that camp for inner city kids. I was 18 years old. Wally was nine Wally said words that I didn't even know what they meant. He had a vocabulary that would have made anyone blush. And I'm just like asking other people, like, do you, do you know what this means? Like he said this and I, I'm, I know it's probably not a good thing, but I'm just trying to understand what it means. And I'm telling you right now, Wally tore me up that week. I mean, up one side and down the other. He absolutely destroyed me in every way. I could not manage him. I was hanging on to his coattails as he ran me around that camp. And I finished, I was only supposed to stay at that camp one week and they didn't have enough staff that summer. So I was just going to pop out there for one week and then go back home and work a regular summer job. I chased Wally around that week and I got to end that week and I was like, man, I can't leave this place. Like if there are more kids like Wally and I can be around them and have any minutia of influence on their lives. And if I can get more out of my relationship with them, just learning and just like, it, it was just this beautiful, terrible, messy, uh, there was no redemptive story about it, right? I'm not telling you that like Wally ended up getting best camper of the week, 0% chance. He would have been worst camper of the week. I haven't ever seen him since, to be perfectly honest. He never came back. Those other those other summers that I directed the camp. So I have no idea what he's doing now or where he is. I think about him all the time. But what I remember is that Wally changed the trajectory of my life because I experienced something new. And instead of saying, well, that was nice. That was cool. That was different. I wasn't expecting that. I let myself feel. And because I stayed at that camp the rest of that summer, uh, when I left four years later, the board said it was the, the most successful four years in the history of the camp. And that has catapulted me into all kinds of other opportunities um, that I would have never had. And, and all of that traces back to a little boy from Houston, Texas, who showed up on a bus with a huge afro and did not like me, uh, but whom I fell in love with thinking, how can I 
potentially make the tiniest bit of impact on this incredible young man's life? And that's really the question I've been asking ever since then is how can I make a difference? And that question is taking me all over the world, brought me onto this show, led me to writing books and speaking. And it's a dangerous and beautiful question. The ROI, not just for you, but for a lot of different people changed that day because of Wally. That's fantastic. Your book is called A Billion Hours of Good, Changing the World 14 Minutes at a Time. I'm assuming, Chris, we get it everywhere. Yeah, it's anywhere you might find books. Uh, By the way, we'll also link to your website. We'll link to you on our show notes page. And also, if you get our, our show guide, we've got even more resources around Chris and the great work he does. Chris, thanks a ton for hanging out with us and talking about the ROI of good. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. And appreciate everything you guys do. And I really think even just your show topics are so critical at this time in our country, especially with young people and people who don't have access to this kind of information. Uh, what What a gift it would be if everybody listening took it upon themselves, not just to keep the information for themselves and their own family, uh, but to find somebody in their community who doesn't have access to this kind of information and to to walk alongside them and talk about generational impact. What, what would that be if every single person just chose one person um, that they were going to give some of this to as a gift? We would never know the end of that tale of good. So Man, I love I love what you do. I love the idea of all the just it, this stuff matters, man. It really does. Um, and I really am honored to be on the show. I'm Liz, the chief mom officer. And when I'm not busy being the breadwinner of my family of five, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Chris Field again for stopping by. I wish that guy was more positive. <laughs> Slightly more positive. It's a powerful return on investment. We talk all the time about investing here. What's better, OG, than investing in the world around you and investing in your community? Yeah, I like what he talked about how, you know, when you do something in your area, you know, your community, it doesn't just help you. It helps other people, which in turn helps you. You know, it's kind of like that domino story that he's talking about at the post office. I was thinking about it in the context of, you know, selfishly, if I clean up my neighborhood, my house price is worth more. Right. So everyone else's is too, you know, but if I have, you know, a community garden, I'm I'm just making stuff up. But if I had that, that makes it better for everybody. It also helps me. So. No, that's good. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first, OG. I don't have anything. Uh, I was trying to think of something that would like tied everything together. And all I can think of is ice cream. <laughs> you know, you know, it's been a tough day when I got, Hey, ice cream is good. That's all there's, I can think of. I don't think there's a wrong answer here. It says your loved ones in your time in my script, but ice cream is great. All I can think of is, ice I would agree. But that that whole package right there, OG, that's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. So here's what you do. You go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life, and you will get, bam, a free quote within seconds because the application is super simple. It's easy. It's all online. They've gotten rid of all the baloney questions that they don't need you to answer. It used to take forever for me to help clients fill out a life insurance application. Not like that. Their prices are affordable. All policies issued, of course, by their parent company, Mass Mutual, which is also more than 160 years old. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to our good friend, Nathan. Say hi, Nathan. Hi, Joe and OG. One of my good friends is looking to sell a small business because he's moving out of the state and would not want to run it from halfway across the nation. This business is one I've always wanted to run and open on my own, and they approached me prior to anyone else with this opportunity. This business is a franchise that's run globally as well, so I would have the help and support on that aspect too. I've never owned a business, but I do know the industry fairly well as I've been using this company for more than 10 years, and I feel like I have enough knowledge on how it works and how it's run to continue to be successful. It's strictly member-based, so the chances of the business failing overnight is highly unlikely. My first thought is to run this through my CPA, review the P&L statements, as well as the prior year's tax returns, as well as give me a lesson on small business taxes because that's all foreign to me. I would need a small business loan for the purchase price, or I could ask a family member for the loan, but that could become fairly complicated, as I've heard many times before. Thanksgiving dinner tastes different when you owe someone at the table money. I have a full-time job. It would not leave my current position, but I would have my wife leave her position and run the business full-time. 
We luckily have a wonderful manager who works at the location who is a good friend as well. She basically already runs the business. Any thoughts on this? Am I missing anything? Thanks. Hey, Nathan. Thanks for the call. And uh, OG, I've got, I got a lot of thoughts myself, but I'd love to hear yours. Well, I think that um, the plus points are, or the positives on this, nationally lo- known franchise, already an existing you know business model in place, you know the people and the process already in place. You know you're not starting a McDonald's from scratch, you, you know, or whatever the franchise is. It's already up and running. There's known reporting. You've got tax returns and P and L statements and that sort of stuff, so you can actually see what's happened in the past. I don't have any issue with this, especially if it's a business that you're familiar with, a business that you're comfortable owning. But I have to remind you that owning a business isn't as easy as I'll just keep my regular job and then somebody else can run this. You can abdicate tasks, but you can't abdicate responsibility. No matter how many people are on your team, you're still the person that has to solve the big problems. When the county commissioner shows up to do an inspection and it's going to shut your business down for two days, you're the one that has to deal with that, or the county inspector, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, you can't just have somebody else handle that. Or when you get letters from the IRS because the form wasn't filled out correctly, yeah, you can send it to your CPA, but ultimately, you're the one that's responsible for it. So I don't want you to have this impression of like, oh, it's going to be super easy. I just borrow some money and I invent, you know, pay this guy off and then I make money hand over fist. I hope it works that way. I mean, you're picking up another full-time job. That's basically what you're doing. So all of that's fine. The other thing that I would have a really frank conversation with your buddy and say, hey, listen, obviously you were successful with this. You're choosing not to continue to own it because if you were wildly successful, you would continue to own it no matter how far away you lived. Joe, you owned rental property from across the country. You were successful doing it. Eventually, you gave it up. But I own rental property from across the country. I'm successful doing it. I can own a business from other parts of the country too, but I would want to know, so what's the story behind the story? And if this is a really good friend, just be like, don't let me be the guy that figures out that this thing screwed up somehow. Like, Have somebody else figure that up. You talk about own family money and having Thanksgiving taste bad. Buy a business from your best friend and have it explode in your face and see how your friendship goes. That's the only thing that's a little kind of weird about it to me is like, if it's so great, your buddy would figure out a way to run it. You know what I mean? Or, or Nathan has figured out a dimension of this business that the friend hasn't figured out because I don't think you can, don't get me wrong. I really like all this attention to, to the downside and protecting your downside, but also to your point, OG, there's gotta be an upside, right? Like the one thing I didn't hear from Nathan is, is the upside. So when you say that, Hey, if this is a great business, why isn't your friend doing it? My question is, is what makes this special? What makes this worth owning? So there's gotta be some treasure in there that I can mine. And I didn't hear what that, that treasure was, by the way, a couple of resources while we're at it. Anytime you talk about running a business, you gotta, you gotta read the E-Myth. Yeah. I think that's just one oh one. And then number two is listen to John Warlow, and it looks like Warillo, but John Warlow's podcast Built to Sell, and also read as much as you can of John Warlow's stuff because he works on this very topic about buying and selling businesses. Yeah. But don't let your buddy read it because then your buddy will sell you, right. charge him more. Do not make John your secret weapon. By the way, we had John on the show a little bit ago. We'll put it in the guide and we'll also put it uh, on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com for anyone that's interested in buying and selling uh, businesses. But final verdict on Nathan, you'd say not a bad idea? No, it's, I mean, it sounds like he's focusing on all the good stuff. I yeah, just, I'm I with you, OG, not sure what the upside is. He's doing a good job of protecting his downside, but don't you think he's got to know the upside? Yeah, absolutely. What's in it for me? Thanks for that, Nathan. Hey, If you've got a question for us like Nathan did, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, and we'll are happy to answer your question, whether it's about paying down debt, having the right emergency fund, buying the right insurances, investing appropriately, buying a business, your estate plan, tax planning, 
whatever it is, bring it stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And we're sending Nathan some collectible Kelly green Haven lifeline swag, the greatest money show on earth swag. That's going to do it for today. Hey, thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this podcast. We appreciate so much when people take the time to leave a review of this show. And there's actually a couple things that you can do. Number one is if you feel like this is a topic that somebody needs to hear, well, then by all means, please share the episode. That's how we grow the show and what we do. And also, if you're new to the show and you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe or follow. That button's called one of two different things, and it's free to subscribe or follow us. But that means that whenever we have new episodes, they appear immediately on the player where you're listening to us now. But also, thanks to people who left us a review of this podcast. Here's one mom has on the refrigerator from Nick MP. Entertaining five stars. Great financial podcast you can listen to for a long time. Some financial podcasts run out of ideas and get boring over time, but this one constantly talks about current events and brings on interesting guests. Thanks so much for that review, Nick. And mom bragging about you today on the refrigerator. By the way, if you leave us a review, feel free to send me a note. And officially, I'm putting everybody's name in a hat for some of the review books that we have. I get books ahead of time so that we can prepare for our interviews. But I have so many OG, I've been sending them to everyone lately. I'm not sure how long I can continue that, but at the very least, we'll be able to give away a book a week. Shoot me a note, joe at stackingbenjamins.com, and we're happy to do that. And finally, last, but as they say, definitely not least, this show is all about making better decisions with your money, right? And if you're somebody that really needs a better team in your corner, we talk about how important that is. Today, we talk with Chris Field about how important it is for charitable organizations to have you on their team. Well, if you need better people on your team, OG and his team are taking on new clients. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG when you're ready to make that hiring decision. And uh, that will link you to their calendar where you can have a discussion about what it would take to have them interface with you so that the second half of 2021 and into 22 looks good for you. That rhymed. It was pretty inadvertent, but I'm a, I'm a wizard. A lyrical masterpiece. Right. <laughs> that's good. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you've got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headline. Inflation? Your takeaway should be that emergency funds are important, but too much in a bank account? That money loses purchasing power. Second, take a lesson from Chris Field. You only need 14 minutes a day to do some serious good. Where will you start? But the big lesson... It only took me 14 minutes to invite the whole basement to the Sizzler, 14 minutes to empty Joe's wallet, and another 14 minutes for Joe to chew me out. And that's where the final 63 minutes goes. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. To learn more about Chris Field and how you can disrupt the world for good, check out his new book, a billion hours of good. It also takes less than 14 minutes to introduce a new stacker to financial literacy. Help somebody dive in. Nothing we like more than seeing someone take the plunge. I mean, except Joe. You don't want to see that in a wet t-shirt. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2021, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by Taylor Stevens with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen, check out our show notes page written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. Brooke and Joe also collaborate on a guide to the show and with lots of extras we couldn't include on today's podcast. Heck, they'll also throw in some life money lessons from Joe and it's all free. It's called The Stacker. And you'll find it at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. Once we get all of this goodness bottled up, it goes over to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. 
who helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to talk about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group, The Basement. She also is our social media coordinator, so say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. She and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. For a URL that'll take you right to our Facebook group, by the way, type stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, reminding you in the words of Stephen Wright, if at first you don't succeed, then skydiving is probably not your thing. Build. The bury my head in the sand approach. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should do the anti barrier head in the sand approach. And to do that, I think partnering up with Navy Federal Credit Union is a great way to go. Let's talk about paying down credit card debt. You could get a low intro APR on balance transfers that are platinum credit card. It's their lowest rate card and a great tool to pay less interest to quote the man while you're paying down debt. Or let's say that next home improvement project, you're putting your strategy together. They can help you get started there. They offer a home equity line of credit with convenient access to funds when you need them so that you're not taking out a bunch of debt all at once. Just Money's available. Oh, I got to build this part, put that on the house. Bam. You can also get a fixed rate equity loan that has set monthly payments for large purchases. Consolidating debt with a home equity loan could also streamline and lower your monthly payments. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA, equal housing lending, membership required, loan subject to approval. Call 1-888-842-6328 for details about credit cost and terms. HELOC APR is low as 6.5% as of November 23rd, We've talked about a lot of stuff in the after show lately, OG. And one thing we haven't talked about is I've finally been going back to the theater lately. It feels so good to go to back into a movie theater. Get some buttery popcorn. I know some people don't like the movie theater. They don't like that experience. I don't know if it's my anxiety or ADD or whatever, but when you put me in a theater and I can't do anything else and I'm expected to just watch the screen just all this other stuff going on in the back of my head just goes away. And I get into the movie in a way that I can't do it on my sofa. Friends of ours, and we've had these discussions in our Facebook group, the basement, they continually, you know, they're like, I don't like spending that money at a theater. I, for me, it's some of the best money I spend. It's your happy place. It is. And I like bitching about Cinemark too. So, which is good. But this is a film I saw a couple of weeks ago down at the Robinson theater a neat little theater community theater in shreveport it stars luke wilson and martin sheen and it's called 12 mighty orphans name's harvey newell russell i'm the new math science teacher the football coach (laughs) we take survivor if we don't they'll never make it on the outside thing about football is it teaches teamwork and discipline, and those are key elements to survival. The way I see it, you can either work the field or play the field. Hell sounds good to me. I mean, might as well. Okay. Ready, set, play! <laughs> this is going to be even more work than you imagined. Today we're going up against a team that's won two state championships. Stay down in the dirt where you belong, loser orphan. That's a funny formation. 
your new offense line up a quarter yard directly behind AP for the snap. What position does that make me, coach? We'll call you the quarterback. This is how we're going to beat the bigger teams. We don't have the size, so we got to utilize what we do have, speed. We finally got a team. Might as well call them the Mighty Mighty. So this is a true story or based on a true story of an orphanage during the Great Depression. And it's set in an orphanage outside of Fort Worth, Texas, where a new football coach comes. He's been a successful coach in Temple, Texas, where he did great things, takes on this role. There's 11 people for people not familiar with football. There's 11 people on a football team. Uh, going one way that are on the field at one time. He's got 12 kids total on his team, OG. And he gets a special exception near the beginning of the movie to play because everybody thinks that because he only has 12 kids, he's going to be a patsy. And at first he is a patsy. The team doesn't do well. And as you heard, uh, you heard the voice of Luke Wilson as this football coach telling his daughter, who is drawing circles on a, on a page because she's sitting across from him at a table. And he, of course, is putting X's and O's on a page, uh, designing formations. His daughter makes this weird formation where everybody's all spread out. And he goes, huh, that's, that's really strange. And he realizes they don't have size and they're getting their brains kicked in by these other teams, but they have speed. And so he creates the position of quarterback for the first time, which was weird at that point. And he also creates the spread offense. And now that coach, Rusty Russell, is in the Football Hall of Fame. This is a movie that got uh, a pretty low score on Rotten Tomatoes, got a 5.8, which is not good. You know what? I I got to say, I... I enjoyed this movie. I enjoyed how this movie is the word to describe it is this movie is earnest. You know, what's coming, you know, exactly how they're going to do it. They do exactly the little mission that they have. And then the movie's over and it, it does every single thing. It is a paint by numbers. I won't tell you anything about the movie, but you will not be surprised by anything that happens because it is a paint by numbers movie that makes you feel good about people, about life, about, uh, and about this, this particular football team's journey. A good Friday night popcorn movie. I love it. I, I just, I thought it was a really, really good, uh, family, family movie. So big, uh, thumb up from me for a movie that didn't get a ton of great reviews, 12 mighty orphans. Um, I, I highly, highly recommend it. 